Fuck you, Dad. I want to go stay with Mom. What was that, boy? I'm sorry, Dad. I didn't mean it. Hades was developed by Supergiant Games, who seemed to be on a mission to make, God forbid, fucking amazing games on a budget that would make most AAA companies cringe. There's a quick spoiler for this video I need to get off my chest immediately. This game is good. I think it's fucking fantastic. It's got a full recommendation from me. The gameplay is fast paced and addicting, the narrative is basic yet compelling thanks to the characters, and the soundtrack fucking slaps. And despite being a roguelike, there's not too much repetition to make me loathe the game. You'll go through the same areas with the same enemies, but Hades constantly adds in tiny variations to each run that make the experience feel fresh every single time, whether that's your third run or your 20th. So just like the Wingman video, if you like taking my words at face value, go buy this game. It's worth the money. Should have easily knocked off Last of Us 2 for the game of the year, but hey, money fuels award shows. Anyway, Supergiant came up with the shocking idea to actually let their player base help build Hades into a final product with their feedback releasing an early access version into the world in December of 2018. But let's not pretend that Supergiant are strangers to the development process, because Hades is actually the fourth game they've made. And I tell you, there's companies out there that have many, many more years of experience in trial and error than these guys, yet they produce a gnat's fart in terms of quality by comparison. All of the games Supergiant has put out to this point, Bastion, Transistor and Pyre, have all been well received and for good reason. They've continuously made well-performing, polished games that can come back years later and still treat you to a good time. Hades is merely the latest addition to that trend. So as player feedback steadily dripped in over the weeks and months of 2019, Hades was being polished and changed and tweaked to build up into the game you see before you. And in case I didn't hammer this point home yet, it turned out fucking great. So let me give you the run through as to how each element works, and you can make your own call if you want to play the damn thing or not. The gameplay to Hades, as I said earlier, is very much rooted in the roguelike side of things. What does that mean for the people that don't know? A roguelike is a gameplay system where every time you die, you lose certain temporary items you gained in that run, whether that be upgrades, money, resources, what have you. However, you're not completely set back to zero. You do retain some resources that can normally be used to upgrade your character or weapons to make the next run a little bit easier for you. So by the process of fighting and dying, upgrading your stuff, fighting a little bit further for more resources, dying, upgrading, fighting further, dying, upgrading, you'll eventually build up your character and your skill for the game to eventually break down all the barriers in between you and the end credits. That's the general loop of things you'll go through with Hades, and the ones and zeros in the guts of the game do a damn fine job at keeping everything interesting as you slowly progress throughout your runtime. The main thing that makes each run unique is less so on the side of the weapons, all of which have reasonably different playstyles to them is all the different buffs and weapon modifiers you'll pick up along the way. Because our humble boy Zagreus, son of Hades and Prince of the Underworld, has, with a bit of help from Nyx, drawn the attention of the gods of Olympus. You know, Zeus, Athena, Aphrodite, Poseidon, all those characters. These higher up gods have designed to give Zagreus their blessings every once in a while. Some of these blessings are great, like literally anything from Zeus. Some of them are pretty okay, like any damage over time buff from Dionysus or Aphrodite. Some of them need a bit of time to activate, like Ares, but I won't say that any buff over the entire game is useless. There might be some that are ill-suited for your current build, but in a different run, that might be the game changer you need to blast through the current section. Now, I'm no expert on roguelikes, or video games in general for that matter, but I'll go out on a limb and say that none of the weapons in Hades are necessarily better than one another. You might find one that's a bit easier to play with, but you need to keep in mind that a single buff can make the difference between a slightly annoying weapon and something that can nuke bosses. 
Speaking on weapons, let's talk about the core real quick. Firstly, you've got the Stygian Blade, the very first weapon you start with. Now, I could go into the lore and the mythological backing behind each weapon and god, but I don't want to. So let's just say that the Stygian is very effective at focusing down single targets at close range, with a nice special move when you need some AoE for the mobs. Next on center stage is Coronacht, the heart-seeking bow. If you like dashing in this game, which you fucking should because it's effective as all hell, Coronacht is going to be one of your favorite weapons because of how fast you can deal damage with rapid dash attacks. Stack a few damage over time buffs and completely forget to use the standard attack and you'll be nuking health bars like it's no one's business at all. Although there is one explosive buff for the standard shot that can make it pretty hefty. The third weapon you receive is Aegis, the Shield of Chaos. Of all the weapons made available to you in Hades, this is actually the one I managed to get my first clear run with because Zagreus does his best Captain America impression and yeets this thing at enemies before it bounces off them and every wall nearby by to deal some nice fucking damage. Add on something like a chain lightning effect and you've got a bloody winner of a weapon. There's also a bull rush ability but I didn't use that one too much. Yeeting is much more my thing. Here, let me show you one of the endgame chambers I ran into. <laughs> Fourth weapon on the rack is the Eternal Spear, Varatha. Probably has the longest reach in terms of the melee weapons, which kind of makes sense considering it's a fucking spear. But the dash attack you can rip off with this one might as well travel halfway across the map. It's got so much reach. I managed to pick up a buff that changed the usual sweep this thing has to an extremely rapid jab sequence. If you focus on one enemy with that buff, they're done. Game over for them. The second to last weapon you can play with is probably my least favorite one. But to repeat my point, I probably just didn't pick the right buffs to complement it, is the Twin Fists of Malphon. They're basically oversized brass knuckles meant for killing gods. Being the weapon I've got the least experience with, I only really found it effective by dashing straight up an enemy's asshole and giving them a quick flurry before dashing back out. Not my jam, but I'm sure someone's found out how to use them properly. Final death dealer you get your mitts on is Exegriff, the Adamant Rail. It's a gun that doubles up as a mortar. The moment I got this thing, I damn near got to the final area of the game in one try. One thing I'll say about this guy, however, while it's very, very usable in its standard mode, if you get the chance, Get the bottomless mag burst fire buff you can get from Daedalus and it becomes nearly unstoppable. All of the weapons are viable. It remains up to you how you modify them over the course of each run and ultimately how useful they end up being. Those modifications are in a few different forms. One is in the permanent upgrades you gain from the Mirror of Night, a gift from Nyx to Zagreus. The upgrades themselves are gained from using Darkness, these little shard things you'll be picking up more than a few of along your journey out of hell. I'd say they're critical, but the coins of Charon can prove just as valuable, even if they're less permanent. These coins can be used to buy stuff from Charon, the boatman of the sticks, in exchange for various temporary buffs that only last a few encounters at a time, or some basic heals or darkness boosters. But you can also use them to buy endgame resources like Titan's Blood or the diamonds that can be used to upgrade your weapons and passive buffs throughout hell itself. You could also buy the boons from the various gods, which from the top include Zeus, Poseidon, Athena, Aphrodite, Artemis, Ares, Dionysus, Hermes, Demeter, and Chaos. All of these gods have their own specific twists on their buffs. For example, boons from Ares normally come with a status effect called Doom, which deals a hefty amount of damage after a brief delay, whereas someone like Poseidon can give knockback to your ranged casts, or a damage over time buff when the enemy moves. Kind of like how Dionysus can give general damage over time, called Hangover, when you graze an enemy. Artemis is focused on crit chance, Athena on deflection, Hermes on raw speed, etc, etc. Depending on which god's symbol you see leading to the next room can very much determine the rest of your run moving forward from the early game, especially when it comes to chaos. Not only do you need to sacrifice some health to even see this bastard, their boons normally come with a debuff for a few encounters before you get the actual buff in itself. Most of the time, in my experience, it's worth the trade-off. When I was streaming this game on Twitch, <coughs> shameless plug, <coughs> 
I called this game a bullet hell. For most of my playtime, I was very, very wrong. But on the odd occasion, notably in boss fights, I was very right. As there's a few reoccurring bosses you'll be running through on your way to the surface. And I tell you, these lads, ladies, and snakes aren't here to fuck around. From the word go, you're in for a fight. Even once you've learned the game and have built yourself up a little, you're still going to have a bit of suffering ahead of you. Hell, even once you've finished the story, the game says, hey, wanna go harder? I'm partially convinced that Supergiant have created some sort of infinite game loop that never actually gets old or boring at all. Even though I've died about 20 times before finally finishing the overall main objective of Hades, I won't say that the content ever got samey. Each run truly felt distinct and unique enough from the others that I didn't mind the fact I'd be back here soon enough because I got fucked over by those two bastards in Elysium again. That freshness, I feel, is owed to the characters you constantly encounter throughout the normal loop of fighting and dying as you try to reach the surface. But this is still the gameplay section, and for a full talk on the characters, I'ma wait until the narrative. But to get to the narrative, we have to go through the soundtrack. And boy, what a soundtrack he be. <laughs> The Wall of Noise for Hades was built by a madman named Darren Korb, a gent whose only other works exist inside other Supergiant games, composing the music for the rest of their gaming catalog. It should also be noted that Darren is the voice actor for Zagreus and Skelly, as well as the singing voice for Orpheus. So the man clearly has a bit of talent about him, a talent showcased from the title screen. Corb once described the OST to Hades as Mediterranean Progressive Rock Halloween, which is fitting because given the mythology the game is based around, I know Corb used a bazooki for parts of the soundtrack. The bazooki being a native Greek instrument for those of you who haven't seen my Assassin's Creed videos covering Odyssey. Doing a bit more digging, I found out that Darren is mainly a digital composer. I'll briefly explain what that means right after you listen to more of this man's brilliance. Okay, so Mr. Korb over here is mainly a digital composer, just like I said about 25 seconds ago. Mr. Gordon over here is primarily an analog composer. If you've watched half a second of the Doom documentary that covers Mick's work, you would have seen the massive analog rack in his studio. It's basically the various compressors and effects pedals that he flushes his music through to make the now signature Doom feeling soundtrack. Korb doesn't have a massive analog rack, not at his home studio anyway. Instead, he's got a guitar, a keyboard, and a digital drum kit, with all the compressors and effects pedals Mick would normally have sitting inside his fancy Eldrick Musician program. The main difference you CAN notice between these two methods, and I say CAN because sometimes it's fucking hard to tell. The hardware approach Mick uses might destroy the audio by the time it gets to the computer, but it will still be relatively clean. Using the almost purely digital method that Darren's gone with, can add a sort of artificial crackle to the sound itself. This is something people do on purpose. The electro group Noisier is quite fond of it for some of their songs. I only noticed in one of Darren's songs, however, and that was in isolation after finishing my playthrough, not in the final boss fight when the track actually plays. This track right here, probably my favorite overall. Maybe because of the pants shitting terror of the unexpected second phase, or maybe it's the fact that this is actually, ultimately, the final boss of Hades, and I'm not even a little bit ready for the ass pounding I'm about to receive. 
The range on the composition from Corb is something to be mentioned as well. It's some solid work all over. There's heavy fighting tracks with a nice guitar riff carrying the weight, then there's more melodic pieces to mix in with the calmer areas you can encounter. Most of note, in my mind of course, would be this little number that plays when you meet a certain lady in the fire pits of Asphodel. <laughs> Yes, mm -hmm. agreed. More soundtracks like this, please. It's got variation and quality in bucket loads. Darren Corb and everyone else involved with making this listing, they deserve full credit. Further credit should be given out to the voice actors for each character you meet in the trials to make it to the surface. I don't think there's a single poorly voiced character along the entire journey. From the first words out of Zag's mouth to the last bits with Parasophony, all of the VA is bloody good. And it does a lot of work in lifting these characters up and giving them their own personality, despite most of them being a single picture of animation when they interact with you. What else can I say about it? The soundtrack, kinda like the rest of the game, is well polished and honed to a knife's edge of quality. It does a good job at making the game more enjoyable and more memorable as a result. The narrative and progressive story through each run of the gauntlet does a good job of character building as well. So, the plot to Hades is actually pretty simple. Zagreus wants to get out of the underworld. Why? Because he recently discovered that Nyx, the demon woman who just emits mommy vibes, isn't his real mother. Someone called Parasophony is Zag's birth mother. So, after realizing this lie, Zag tries to bugger off to see his real mum, with the help of his not real mum. Problem is, no one can leave the underworld. So, Zag needs to literally fight his way out of hell and past a whole bunch of people and monsters who don't want to see him go, especially his father, Hades himself. With enough help from the Olympian gods and enough time upgrading his latent powers, Zagreus does finally make it to the surface to see his birth mother, just for the taint and corruption of the underworld to pull him back into its depths whether he wanted them to or not. That's the basic story, but it technically carries on even from that point, being that Hades isn't really a game that can truly end in the traditional sense until you've done 100% of the available things, and there's a lot of things to do, trust me. The part of the narrative that makes it stand out, outside of the rather simple overarching plot, is the very, very colourful cast of characters you encounter on your path throughout the underworld. I mentioned a lot of said characters in the gameplay section, but I didn't even touch on the cathartic gods, or the other people you meet in the odds and ends of the underworld. From the three Fury Sisters, to Sisyphus, to Patroclus, to Nyx and Hypnos, right over to the lovely Dusa and Achilles, all of the characters are enjoyable in their own way. And if the cataclysmic scale of fan art of these characters didn't let you know that there's at least one character to please everyone who plays this game, I can't fucking help you. For the record, just so it's here, Nyx is a mommy, I'll die for Achilles and Sisyphus, if anyone hurts Dusa, I will flay their family alive. And Meg? She bad. Most of the characters can have their own interactions with Zag after every run, noting the last enemy that killed you, a new person you might have met, how close you might have been to finally getting out of hell. There's got to be some very specific dialogue generation going on in the guts of this thing, because barring two separate instances, I never heard the same bit of dialogue from any character. It's the most impressive thing about Hades in my mind. The gameplay is still great, the soundtrack still slaps, but it's the rather basic narrative, or rather, the overwhelming volume of character it carries within it that makes this game notable. Every person you meet in this game has a personality. You can draw lines between one and another to pick out what their relationship might be. Example, Meg and Dusa. Meg is a very professional guard. One that just wants Zagreus to head back home willingly to keep the house of Hades intact. If he resists, she'll just use a bit more force than usual in sending him back. Dusa, on the flip side, is the caretaker of the house. 
She spends her time cleaning the entire place and keeping everything looking proper, almost to the point where she doesn't really view herself in any real importance. Meg and Dusa also happen to be drinking buddies, which I found fucking adorable for both of them. Keep in mind that these characters don't have any narrative specific animation to them, and largely exist purely as a voice attached to a drawing, yet they've still got character pouring out of them. If I had to sum up this game in a sentence, it'd be easy, but hey, this isn't the rounding out section, so I don't think it'd be proper for me to just tell you right away. Hades. Come for the gameplay, stay for the soundtrack, and love it for the characters and circling narrative. The gameplay is fast and addicting, embedding itself into your brain with the ever dangerous just one more run way of thinking that's been the bane of many a sleep cycle. No two runs are going to be the exact same, because the amount of variation between choosing your weapon at the start, the dice roll for every buff you receive after that, reaches into the highest heights of Olympus. The soundtrack from Darren Korb has some certified bangers to the ear of this metalhead, opposed by some equally good calm tracks for the in-between points of the more intense fights waiting for you in the depths of the underworld. The overall sound design as well from the voice acting and sound effects from weapons and enemies, yes, even the mini chariots that meow at you, are all excellently done. Solid work from the sound department all the way around. The narrative is the frame that holds up the characters. The plot is the goalposts for the player to aim for, and both the friends and enemies you meet along the way will make your journey to the surface all the more enjoyable. You'll be picking favorites and writing fanfics before you realize how deep into this game you really are. Hades is a must buy, it's that good. If you've got the spare change, go for your life. There's more than a little bit of time to kill in this one, and it's worth its weight in gold. I'll spit out the hot take. Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, and Doom Eternal, all should have been tied for Game of the Year and Gameplay Awards. I now anoint these games as the holy trinity of 2020, and the only good thing to happen that whole year. If that's not a glowing recommendation, fuck, I don't even know. That's it for this video, however. If you've played Hades, tell me your favorite god companion and why. Thirst posts are acceptable, just keep it in line. I don't want to swing around the TOS hammer too much. Maybe like and subscribe and do that stuff that helps me out in the algorithm. I'd be appreciating your generosity. I've also got the Twitch channel you could check out where I record all the background stuff for this footage and show off my extremely flimsy understanding of the English language. There's also a Discord, if that's your sort of thing. I have been the infamous Sir Hellfire, you have been my lovely brethren. For the next one, we once again pay homage to a vegetable on a throne and overwhelm the enemy with numbers alone. I'll see you all in the next one. Ciao. By the Emperor, a Bane Blade.